I'm also very grateful to my team, Sarah Deverne this weekend, who is our producer, Finley Knowles, who was answering the phones and almost mastered Gaelic or Welsh. No, oh God, I got it wrong again. Tech Up Dave, Dave Rhodes, the ever consummate professional behind the desk, and Minty Gow, our visual producer. So if you couldn't see me, that's her fault. And Parrick Thomas, video editors, and of course, our wonderful weekend editor, Phil Dave, uh, who basically is pretty much here 24 7. I've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it. I think I've learned a lot. I hope you've learned a lot. And thank you for sharing your views. We'll do it all again next Saturday. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the pan. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale, and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what's uh, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late-night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious. Welcome back. Welcome, well, welcome back. I just said that because I've been having that chat with uh, Nick Dubois. Uh, so it's Law Allier Portrait Sondadini. It's uh, Happy St. Patrick's Day, as you can see, if you're watching Talk TV. I'm wearing green, and we're going to weave that uh, theme through through the show. Light and shade, as always. Um, we're going to be talking about St. Patrick when it comes to our faith panel. It's interesting, having doing a little bit of um, research on St. Patrick. He um, he was captured and held as a slave, although there's some debate about that. He was actually born in Roman England and, and captured and brought over to Ireland. Some people say he, he fled to Ireland to stop being drafted up by the Roman army, but whatever. Um, he, as a foreigner in Ireland, he found things really difficult. Um, and so anyway, I'm going to be asking our faith panel. We have a, um, a Catholic parish priest and we have the Reverend Sandra Miller, who's the head of life events at the Church of England. I'm going to be asking them what they think we can learn today from St. Patrick's life. Also, in light of Michael Gove talking about Michael uh, uh, Frank Hester's remarks about um uh miss abbott diane abbott uh michael gove says okay he's forgiven you know he, he's apologized we should be extending or warranting christian forgiveness now as we if you watched yesterday's show um we talked about that wasn't the only thing that frank hester has been accused of saying apparently once he was having a meeting uh, discussing with his staff um about the racism uh, complaints of racism there were indian people there and apparently their offices were near a train station and he said oh if there's not enough room here maybe you can go out and sit on a, a train roof or something like that but here's my question to you about forgiveness. Do you believe that if someone has shown behavior, one-offs, maybe, whatever, do you think there's such a, a thing as just Christi Christian forgiveness? Is forgiveness somebody saying, oh, I'm sorry, or is it an action? Do you want to see change rather than hear someone say, oh, I'm sorry? How many times have people said, oh, I misspoke? Oh, I made a mistake? Oh, what have you? And uh, that's it. That's that's it. It's over. I'm sure in your life there has been somebody whose forgiveness you, you're not willing to accept because there are the words, but where the hell are the actions? So that's my question to you. It's about forgiveness. When should people be forgiven? Do you think we should forgive just because somebody says, I'm sorry, even though they might carry on doing the same old thing? 0344-499-1000. You can text the word TALK to 87222. You can X at TALK TV. Let me tell you the other things we are talking about today. That photograph of... Um, uh, Catherine and the family, what have you. We're going to be talking to a celebrity photographer about um, everybody. Every, isn't everybody at it? Mix, you know, with their photos and, and, and putting different screens and lens on them and touching them up. Um, also, the family member who's most likely to sexually abuse a child in a family is their brother or their sister. There's been research on it. It's absolutely massive, apparently. It is a taboo subject. The press won't and can't report on it. They're not allowed to report on it. They just have to say somebody, person X and person Y. But because we're not talking about it, there's huge damage. And it's one of the fastest growing areas of sexual abuse because it is so taboo. And normally the press won't talk about it. I am going to be doing that. Um, men can be uh, abused, domestically abused. We're going to be looking at that as well and a whole lot of other things. Um, so what I want to do is first come to that subject that I touched upon, um, uh, men being abused 
when we always think it's women being domestically abused. Um, there's nanny cam footage which exposed an abusive wife. Secret camera footage shows a battered husband being threatened with a knife, being beaten, cowering in a fetal position during his wife's 20 year reign of terror um it's a channel 5 documentary my wife my abuser the secret footage it airs on monday now what this has done is open up an area that's not talked about domestic abuse against men and when they try to speak out about it they're seen as wimps do they speak out about it uh, joining me now is Professor Ben Hein, who is a uh, professor of applied psychology at the University of uh, West London. Let me just give you some of his background. Um, he is one of the trustees of something called the Mankind Initiative. It's an incredible charity supporting male victims of domestic abuse. And it's the first in Great Britain to support male victims. And listen to this. Their helpline is currently receiving more calls than ever. Uh, ben spent years researching gender stereotyping and domestic abuse and uh, joins me now. Ben, as I said before, the when you say domestic violence domestic abuse immediately you think of women being abused by men uh, you know one of i'd say a big taboo a big subject that's not spoken about is the number of men who are domestically abused would i be right in saying let's talk about the barriers let's talk about why we don't hear about men who are in uh, a situation of domestic abuse Hi, thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, I mean, any victim of domestic violence is going to experience barriers because as a as an experience, there is a huge amount of shame, and I want to be clear on that. But uh, when we look at different types of groups, so if we look at male victims, if we look at LGBT survivors, etc., then we see that we get these kind of extra layers of barriers that add on top of that. And so for men, those would look like the internal barriers that they have around the view of themselves as a man and as someone who should be strong and should be independent and shouldn't be a victim, all the way through to the external barriers, which might be things like reactions from friends and from family, and for example, a lack of services and kind of talking about it in society, which is why it's great to kind of do segments like this and, and raise the profile. So yeah, there are a lot of barriers for men in terms of speaking out for sure. Now, a lot of people are gonna be say, uh, saying, and I'm sure a lot of men get this, uh, you must be a wimp. I mean, in this particular story that they're showing on Channel 5, and they've got the, they have got they had nanny cams in the family to keep an eye on the kids, but it also picked up this this awful, you know, mm. one, one with the wife, and the wife was a prison officer as well. Yes, uh, yeah. beefing the law and forcing him to clean it up, beating him uh, and, and what have you. Now, he says in this, he, this, this chap says he's five foot ten and his wife's little. So any body out there I'm, I'm sure are going to say hang on what's a great big towering bloke you're stronger what are you putting up with this for so the question is how do is it a certain kind of man uh why don't they fight back mm. all of those things that the general public would be asking and and the reasons these men don't seek help what 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 can you tell us about that I mean, there are so many reasons why people who experience abuse um, don't leave relationships. And we ask these questions of, of women as well, of course. We say, why didn't you leave him? Why didn't you leave her, etc.? cetera? Um, you know, and there are lots of different reasons for that. Um, you know, one of which often centers around children. People don't want to leave their children with a partner who is being abusive towards them because they might fear they do the same with the children. Um, and, you know, particularly for men, the reason that they might not leave is is maybe around that shame, that embarrassment. And I've certainly uh, spoken to men who have been laughed out of services, laughed out of police stations because they are the bigger, more masculine stereotype. And they're saying I've been abused, I've been physically abused, coercively controlled. And, and people are kind of laughing in the faces of, of these men um, when in reality, anybody can experience abuse because abusive behavior and the receipt of it is a human element it's not a not necessarily a, a gendered phenomenon of course there are gendered experiences and yes the statistics show that depending on which ones you look at you know anywhere between 
um, you know, 50% or down to, you know, 20% are, are men. But I think what we really need to focus on is the individuals in this and their, you know, susceptibility to these behaviours. And in this case, you know, it's not up, it's not up for us to kind of judge or decide whether he should or shouldn't have stayed. The thing we should focus on is that he actually enjoyed these behaviours for 20 years. And a lot of that would have been because he felt that he couldn't leave um, because of those very stereotypes, probably, that you were speaking about. And, and I, reading through, I mean, and, and doing a bit of research around this, I, I realised that if it's a man that's being physically abused, um, in many cases the woman will say, and I think in one case, how about I throw myself down the stairs and blame you? Um, and that is all of this, you know, I can turn around and say, look at little old me, it's you. So mm. there's also that added layer of fear that the woman will deliberately present herself as a victim and be more believed. Mm. And, we, you know, we wouldn't want to get into a position where we're saying, um, you, you know, that it's a, a you know, that, that all of the allegations of domestic violence are false and that kind of thing. However... <laughs> I have spoke. I have spoken to many, many men who have said exactly that thing, where uh, the women in their relationship use the stereotypes that you were speaking about um, to put themselves in a position of power. And the reason those are effective is because services do often respond in that way. We see. I, I've spoken to men about examples where they call the police, and they end up getting arrested. Um, I've seen, you know, circumstances where, uh, uh, you know, men are the ones who are the victims and it's very clear, I've spoken to a man where it was a clear cut case that they were the ones who'd been physically abused and their perpetrator, the woman, was bailed back to his house that he owned because oh. it was safer for him, uh, apparently according to the police force, to not go back. So they bailed her to his house and, and she didn't even own it. So, that you know, it really is important to understand just how powerful these stereotypes are in dictating not only how victims and survivors see themselves, but also in terms of how services respond. And I think, you know, as you've suggested, we've got a lot of work to do to really kind of challenge some of these assumptions. And I think that this particular story and the accompanying uh, documentary is really going to help people kind of expand their minds so that if, for example, in the future, a man comes to them and says similar things, then hopefully they will be believed. And it, it, it strikes me as well, we talk about women's refuges, and you just talked about that case where the woman was bailed back to the house that the man owned. I'm, I'm guessing that the man was chucked out. Are there such things as men's refuges for domestic violence? I mean, where, where do they go? Yeah, I'm actually doing a project at the moment on men who have been made homeless through their experiences of domestic violence, um, because sadly we see the case. Um, and again, I want to stress that domestic violence services for everyone are underfunded. And uh, and of course, whenever we talk about increasing men's provision, it's never to the detriment of women's provision. However, there is a stark contrast in the amount of spaces that are available and dedicated to women in the country versus for men. Um, I don't have the exact number, but I think it's somewhere between two to 300 beds that men could access, and that's across the entire country, as opposed to several thousands of beds for women. And at the present, uh, hardly any, if any at all, actually allow access for men to take children with them, whereas it's something that we would never question for a woman fleeing. We would say, of course, she would bring the children with them, but men don't have the option and often don't feel that they can do that because of how it will look. Um, so, yes, sadly, I have been speaking to men who, as a result of their victimization, end up having to leave their home, even if it's something that even if it's a home they fully own and seek sofa surfing, uh, homeless shelters, uh, Salvation Army, because they've got nowhere else to go. So it's um it's a it's a complex puzzle. We need to tackle tackle it from the very beginning in terms of awareness, but then we need to provide places for these men to actually go and get the support they need. Um, we've got somebody on on the line. We, uh, mm -hmm. his, we're giving him the name of Gary, um, and we're saying it's Sussex. It's not his real name. It's not his real location. I, I'm sure you can understand why. So, Gary, hello. What, what did you want to say? 
Um, yeah, I mean, initially, um, it took a lot of courage to um, to leave my ex-wife, and precisely uh, for one of your guests' reasons, um, it, it was because I was so worried what she'd do to the kids in retaliation. So I, I spent 25 years with my ex-wife. Um, Did you talk about what you went through? Sorry? Can you talk about what you went through? It was more psychological. Um, yeah, it, it was. I was constantly put down, uh, branded as gay. Uh, there, there was the odd incidents of violence. Um, there was one time I had to smash a bottle. She threatened me with a bottle. And then I had to smash it across my own head just to diffuse the situation because I was worried she'd shove it in my face. Wow. Do you look back at, at, at what you went through and wonder why you didn't get out or do you know why you didn't get out? Well, well, it was just basically because of the kids. Right. I was so worried. I, I was worried she'd use them as ammunition. And to be fair, when I did leave, that's, that's exactly what she'd done. So but there was no what, help. What? There, like social services, any of these right. government institutes, it, it, it all goes on what the woman says initially. So she obviously accused me of domestic violence against her, this, that, the other. And, and I had to just sit back and wait until it was proven different, which then put my kids in danger. Mm. Right. What did it do? What has it done to you? Because I'm going to be talking to Ben about the psychological fallout. Because you don't just sort of leave. I mean, and 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 go off into the sunset. It must have a hell of an effect on you. Oh no, it was a constant battle for me because um, I was so worried about my children. And she did have a drink problem. Uh, on top of that, uh, which which you know really exacerbated things. So, um, yeah, I, I, um, the police actually said I had um, Stockholm syndrome. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd basically been brainwashed to, to think that I, I was so bad, everything right. was my fault. Yeah. I mean, everything. So it, it took a lot of courage to get out. Initially, there was, there was so much relief that I'd actually done it, that I'd actually plucked up the courage to get out of this relationship, which was toxic. Um, but then, yeah, then hell come and, um, there, there's loads of stuff that happened to me. So here's the other thing that was it, could you ever tell any of your mates or did you, you know, was there anyone you could speak to? And, and initially no, but then, right. um, I used to have a local pub after work. I'd go in for maybe one, two, two drinks after work. <clears throat> I mean, go home. So she started going down there and then off be openly drunk in front of these people and then they'd see what she was like. So, yeah, after a couple of months, they'd realise, like, well, you know, um, if that's what she's like at home, it's no wonder, yeah. um, it's no wonder I left. Hmm. How, how are you now? Just to finish off, how are you now? Oh, fine. I, I, um, there, there's actually one group... It's based in Bedfordshire, and it's called Talk for Men. And right. uh, the police, the police signpost put me onto that, and uh, they, they they was really really good and instrumental uh, for for me getting a bit of self confidence. There's a lot of shame, like you said, because as, as as you guess said, there's so much shame. It's, it's, it, everything's your fault, you know, and, and and you feel a failure for leaving. Yeah, um, yeah but they, they was really instrumental in helping out. Uh, that was great. I ended up seeing a police psychologist said I've got Stockholm syndrome. Um, and then um, you, your memory crashes, unfortunately, when you, we're dealing with all this stuff. And uh, yes. so I'd, I'd keep on forgetting to, to visit the psychologist. So after three no visits, they don't see you anymore. Um, I, I, I did say maybe, maybe, maybe gives your clients a text because obviously if memory crashes, one of the symptoms no one's going to remember yeah listen thank you for calling in it took enormous courage to to, to call in um and it, it really puts a human face on what we're talking about and 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 just the difficulty so i really wish you well and i do thank I, you for I, will, I will say one thing i'm now the sole carer for my children 
and I fought like hell for that. And, um, yeah, so, you know, th there is light at the end of the tunnel if anyone does experience it. It's just Thank a lot you. of hard work. Yes. Uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you. As I said before, Gary in Sussex is, is not his name, real name and uh, where he is, but you can understand why we're not uh, giving his real name. Coming back to you, Ben, uh, there were lots of things you were nodding your head at. And of course, we didn't touch upon the psychological abuse. That must be even, you know, like our, 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 our caller talked about. That must be even more difficult as a man to deal with because is it real is it me all of those things that, that you know our caller talked about yeah i you know some of my own work that's looked into this from uh doing interviews with men and looking at the cool data from the mankind initiative has shown that you know men suffer the same range of abuse that that women do um you know all the way through from the physical to the psychological you know the 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 kind of degradation um, you know, right the way through to kind of sexual abuse as well, and in even in ways that we don't necessarily uh, think of, like being forced to have sexual intercourse. So they they really do, you know, they they're really not uh, this kind of really random group that are completely beyond our comprehension. They exist, they're out there, they experience all these things, and they have a huge impact. And all the literature shows that whether you're a man or a woman or LGBT, if you are experiencing abusive behaviour, it will have a profound effect on you and actually most survivors say physical wounds heal psychological wounds stay and uh, so the psychological abuse can actually be in some some ways more more damaging and more long lasting thank you so much for talking with us it's the mankind initiative if people want to google uh, it's a brilliant uh, website it's a brilliant group i've had a look at it myself and thank you ben um for talking to us i think about a, a subject that's very rarely talked about um a professor of applied psychology ben hine there talking about men being the victims and we're not saying that women are, but we're talking in this case about men being on the receiving end of domestic abuse. Back with more in a moment. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, Trico. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what's uh, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back and uh, thank you for joining me. Remember, you can get in touch 03444991000. You can text the word TALK to 87222. You can X at TALK TV. Um, and we've one message here says uh, we've just been talking about um, men being on the receiving end of domestic abuse. Hi, Trisha, I can totally understand an abused man remaining in a relationship if there are children. But if there are no kids involved, they should just leave not go to the police now that's interesting so why should i'm i'm I, 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 this is from rachel um why if a man is on the receiving end of domestic abuse why not go to the police if there aren't any children if anybody's been abused in a family why not go to the police do you agree with Rachel that if a man is being abused in the home, if there aren't any children, he should just leave, not not go to the police, not report? Uh, and in this documentary, he's hit on the head with bottles and all of those sorts of things. Maybe the woman keeps saying, oh, I think I'm pregnant. I've lost the baby, what have you. So if women, we want all victims, surely, of domestic abuse to go to the police. And that's an interesting day. I have to say, Rachel, I have a problem with that. I think violence in the, in the home or anywhere, violence is violence. And if somebody keeps doing it, then you go to the police. Kind of spins back to our, our, our question of the day, which I'm about to ask our faith panel. If somebody says, sorry, um, at the end of it, that's it. Christian forgiveness, should you just forgive and forget? Or should somebody actually show that they're sorry? That's one of the questions we're going to be asking today. What do you think? 0344-499-1000. You can text the word TALK to 87222. You can X at TALK TV. As I mentioned, it is time for our faith panel. I'm delighted to say that joining me today are Father Mark Lydon-Smith, who's a Catholic parish priest, um, and Reverend Sandra Miller, who is the head of life events at the Church of England. England. Welcome both and happy uh, St. Patrick's Day. Um, looking through Pat to St. Patrick's history, apparently he was a foreigner in Ireland. It, he didn't have an easy uh, a, a, an easy job of it. Um, he says that on one in when you look at his, his story, on one occasion he was beaten, robbed of all he had, put in chains, perhaps waiting for execution. Um, he was a captive and what have you. There's a, his whole history, I, I learned uh, uh, that it's a myth that he banished snakes from Ireland. Uh, it's also apparently Christianity had come to Ireland some years before, but he's credited with spreading it. But his whole story of what he stands for, um, the, the using the traditional shamrock with three leaves to represent the Holy Trinity, I'm interested to hear from you what you think, um, uh, what bits of St. Patrick's story you think we can learn from today. So, Father Mark, I'm going to start off with you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Trish. Uh, yeah, um, great saint uh, for the modern world, really. Uh, as you mentioned, he was a victim of human trafficking. It was pirates that took him from his home in Wales, so he was a Welsh, he was British. St. Patrick, he wasn't Irish at all, and he was taken captive and uh, used as a slave um, looking after sheep, uh, which is ironic because he would become the shepherd of the Irish people. He finally escaped, he made his way home. He was kind of educated and uh, he certainly grew up as a tepid Christian, but he was filled with zeal. He had learnt the Irish language and he was filled with a zeal to go back and give them gospel values. 
And as you quite rightly said, uh, there was a small Christian community in Ireland at the time. He was eventually made a bishop and he was sent back to uh, kind of look after that fledgling Christian community in Ireland. But he's known for that missionary zeal uh, when he went out there. And I, I think his, his message today really, I think the UN say there's about 50 million people still human trafficked today. And he, he's a great witness and a reminder that this is a, a scourge of humanity that needs dealt with today. Do you think, do you think, Father, that we've kind of lost the true meaning of St. Patrick's Day? I mean, it's interesting, the St. Patrick's Day March was something that didn't originate in Ireland. It originated in the US, I think, in 1601, originally in, in Florida. And then 100 years later, you know, homesick Irish troops started marching in New York. So the march is very much an American thing. But they've taken mm -hmm. it because it's Lent and uh, Lent is allowed to be broken with food and drink to honor St. Patrick. The, the drink bit has gone off the scale. Do you think we've kind of lost the true meaning of, of um, you know, St. Patrick's Day to alcohol and partying mm -hmm. and everything else? Well, the secular world has certainly hijacked St. Patrick and made him a, an advert for Guinness and booze and partying. That, that's certainly true. Um, but the Irish are a great nation of people that, because of British repression and famine, have, have ended up in shores all over the world. And as you quite rightly say, the parades began, uh, I think, it was in the end of the 1600s in America. But th those, guy were, those guys were Irish and forced to leave the homeland, like St. Patrick. But yeah, the secular yeah. world has kind of hijacked it, and it's become this, this kind of excuse for a party. Um, and that's unfortunate because the story of St. Patrick is so rich and what he managed to achieve in a, a, a small amount of time in Ireland um, and the example and witness that he gave to gospel values and living for Christ, living for Christ by serving others is a tremendous story which needs to be heard loud and clear today in the modern world. Mm absolutely let me put the same question to reverend sandra miller um about what we can take away from st patrick's story uh that would be relevant would be helpful today i think there's almost two things here there's st patrick's story which as um we've heard is a rich story that has much to teach as those of us who are followers of jesus christ uh, those of us who are trying to uh, make our way in the present world there's so many treasures in that story to do with uh, living our faith outwardly but also for me thinking about today there's something really interesting about the way in which this culture that has been spread throughout the world is celebrated and um, the gift we receive from people who have been dispersed through the world and I, I was reflecting on this earlier how how great it is to celebrate people who were migrants actually and the gifts of the Irish people the gifts of song the gift of music all sorts of good things and I was thinking about the fact there's many other cultures in the world that are dispersed and perhaps it might be interesting to have days that celebrate and we do have those days as well that celebrate culture so almost two things there there's that celebration of culture which is fantastic and rejoicing in the gifts that have been everywhere spread by, by that but also as Christians looking deeper into the story and I think one of the particular things for St Patrick I certainly always think of is um, and many of us will know it from the great hymn known as St Patrick's breastplate which reminds us of that commitment to following Jesus whether it was by St Patrick or or not is of course you know these things are tied up in time it's a fifth century uh traditionally fifth century but it, it's got those words in it that reminds of the Trinity reminds of our commitment to Jesus Christ that zeal that you were talking about earlier and that commitment to follow so we have almost two things going on there and again, I'll ask you, do you think, though, with that celebration, and it is great, that, that, that and you both of you make the point about it, is celebrating either the, the trafficked or the, the immigrant people who've been dispersed, etc. But again, alcohol um, has seemed to be, become the main message of St. Patrick's Day. I mean, you know, I, I'm just looking at some of the figures. I mean, Guinness must love St. Patrick's Day. Do you think that's sad in some ways? 
I think um, I'm not sure whether it's alcohol or green. The colour green has become, in many ways, the main uh, message. You you two did well. I I I went for being slightly different. I nearly changed into a green outfit, but um, stayed with blue today um, for no good reason. You're right, because uh, I was reading in my research that once upon a time, blue, uh, a father might know, well. blue was the color, and it, green was adopted, but blue was initially the color, so we're all doing it. We're all correct. Uh, but <laughs> I, I think... I think it's difficult with because alcohol has been part of cultures uh, for so long. You know, at one point it was because the the way of uh, making it was a way of avoiding the fact that water might have poisoned people and so on. But it's when alcohol becomes harmful, harmful to people, and there is something about that excess that can become quite alarming. And sort of when it gets not linked with celebration, perhaps when it gets linked with kind of behaviours that become destructive and difficult. So we do have to take that kind of thing seriously but the party and you know parties are good and all of us enjoy uh being at a celebration in and enjoying ourselves on those days yeah and we, would, we, we, we must remember that uh, jesus public ministry began by changing water into wine and he was partial to a celebration as well so there's no harm in raising a glass today to glorious saint patrick Lovely, a lovely note to finish on, but we're going to keep you because after the break, we're going to be talking about the nature of forgive, forgiveness. Uh, is saying sorry enough or is it, should it be an action? That's what we'll be discussing with our faith panel in just a minute. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back. I'm with our faith panel. Today we have Father Mark Lydon-Smith, who's a Catholic parish priest. Um, and we have Reverend Sandra Miller. I'll get her title right this time. Um, Sandra is Director of Mission and Ministry. Uh, a canon, I beg your pardon, canon Sandra Miller. We'll get you right, Sandra. Canon Sandra Miller is Director of Mission and Ministry in Gloucester. Um, my second question, my second issue with you that we I'd like to discuss, this whole thing about Diane Abbott. Now, Michael Gove has come out and said that Frank Hester's remarks uh, warrant Christian forgiveness. Now, just for anybody who's been living under a rock, um, this is according to The Guardian, and, and Mr. Hester has, uh, you know, said this, this is right. He said, it's like trying not to be racist, but you see Diane Abbott on the TV and you're just like, you just want to hate all black women because she's there. I don't hate all black women at all, but I think she should be shot. Now, um, there are other remarks he's made of racial nature in the past. He says he thinks you should be able to be jovial, you no know, jokey about these things. Or, um, But I want to focus on Michael Gove saying that uh, if somebody says they're sorry, as Frank Hester has said, then Christian forgiveness should be extended. But is it just the word? Or is forgiveness warranting and saying you're sorry? Is it an action? Father, your thoughts on this? Well, Christians, fundamentally, we do absolutely believe in forgiveness. So, uh, yeah, we, we all have to forgive. We, we pray it every day as Christians when we pray the Lord's Prayer, uh, forgive us our trespasses and we forgive those who trespass against us. So it kind of just be a meaningless word, but it, it, it is a word that is ultimately linked with justice. We've got to, we've got to see some justice uh, flow from forgiveness and mercy uh, as well. Um, what he said is disgusting and despicable. But as a Christian, uh, we, I, as a Christian, I would feel called to forgive him. That doesn't mean you forget what someone said. It doesn't mean you just erase it and forget about it. But as Christians, in love, we, we have to try and, with forgiveness and with love, bring them back into the community uh, and certainly not hold grudges. I think there's, there's bigger issues at play here. Um, uh, why is someone giving £10 million uh, to the Conservative, to the Tory party? Does that give him access to ministers? Does that give him uh, input into conversations? Would he have the same access if, as someone who gives £1 to the Tory party? Um, it's a question of inequality, uh, that someone can actually have a... Imagine having to spare 10 million quid to give to any political party, let alone the bloody Tory <laughs> party. But um, th th there's questions about inequality and fairness and justice that I think uh, are privilege and that we have to face up to and have honest discussions about uh, as a nation. But all those discussions flow from forgiveness from a Christian perspective. But uh, Father Mark, and I'll ask um, Sandra this is in a moment as, as well. If you're on the receiving end, if you're a Diane Abbott and you've been deluged with hate, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure it would have gone up from remarks like that and, and fear, yeah. you know, talking about shooting people when yeah. politicians have been killed, do are you saying that even if you're a Diane Abbott, even if you're on the receiving end, um, I've had death threats as well, that we mm -hmm. just say, oh, I forgive you. And and that and that's the end of the matter? No, because uh, I, I don't think I don't think it is the end of the matter of it at all, because as I say, I think there's got to be justice there as well. And for uh someone like Michael Gove to come out and say, oh, well, let's just all forget about it. He said he's sorry and moved on. Well, actually, I, I want to see the fruits of that forgiveness. I want to see uh, a, a humble, contrite heart. I want to see um, what's he doing to atone for those things. Um, if someone's so rich and can afford £10 million to the Tory party, when, well, surely he can donate some of that fantastic wealth to anti-racist campaigns and, and help out. So, no, you don't just forgive and forget, but it's all about the attitude. And for us as believers, 
it, it's very freeing not to hold on to uh, hate or bitterness. Uh, and forgiveness shows its strengths, really, in refusing to take revenge. That's, that's the strength uh, of, of, of forgiveness. So, yeah, big questions and a lot to think about. But as I say, I think that uh, from a Christian perspective, that those discussions come from a position, first and foremost, from forgiveness and mercy in, in wanting the, the situation and the offender to reform and change and be part of the community. Thank you. Canon Sandra Miller, what are your thoughts on this? Forgiveness is a very difficult uh, uh, concept. And in some ways, we talk about two different kinds of forgiveness here. We talk about Christian forgiveness, and there's the forgiveness that comes from the fact that each of us as individuals re receive forgiveness from God in Jesus Christ. And we're about to enter into the season leading up to Good Friday, whereas as Christians, we, we see Jesus on the cross and we think about our own sin, our own responsibility and look for grace and forgiveness from Jesus. But that requires a little word called repentance, and that's a very personal thing. That's about me, me realising my own responsibility in this and, and just falling on the mercy of God. And repentance doesn't just mean, you know, I'm sorry, it means a change of life. And so we then need to see how we try and, and fail to live differently, to live from those different values, the way that Jesus called us to live. So there's that sense of forgiveness isn't is from God, actually. I, I also think we get into a muddle when we conflate forgiveness, as, as, as Father Mark has already said, with forgetting. And we it isn't, or thinking that it means there are no consequences to what we do, because that's a different thing. And actually, forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting at all. We forgive and remember. And actually, it's out of that remembering that we start speaking for justice. We start speaking up for people who have no voice, whose voice is being oppressed. And we say, actually, we need to take some action in our repentance. But also, there is a culture of grace, you know, where people sometimes can, we make mistakes i'm not saying that you know we make misjudgments all of us do that and we say sorry to an individual and sometimes we can get in individual uh, apologies individual can only say that you know on a personal basis and it's about that relationship that's being built whether that's that big concept of a relationship with god in jesus or whether that's how we create good relationships in our community through trust and through building and repairing and repairing relationships as well when they fail and break down. But I can't do that for the people we're talking about. I can't do that for people there. I can do it in my own set of relationships where I mess them up and do <laughs> forgiveness. But in this sense, it becomes quite a difficult concept. Yeah, and let me let me ask you, and I'm going to go back to uh, Father Mark for this one. Uh, but Father Mark, if uh, apparently um, Frank Hester said he tried to ring Diane Abbott a couple of times, uh, she didn't take his calls. Can you, if you feel wronged, if you're angry with someone, even though you for you might have forgiven them, but not forget? It's, is it your right to say, you know what, I don't want your personal apology. I don't want a bar of you anymore. Um, or do you grit your teeth, go through pain and hear that apology? Because basically, isn't that apology for the person who's wronged more than you sometimes? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's a very personal thing in one sense, but Diane Abbott is obviously receiving... Uh, a lot of abuse online. This is a type of issue when it's thrust into the public light again. Um, she could be receiving a barrage of hate again, and she's had a lot of it in her career. Um, so I, I think you've got to be patient with people and have an understanding. But and and if she if she's not ready to, then I would fully support her. But again, I think it's all about attitude. You know. Martin Luther King, uh, he led the civil rights movement. He didn't do it out of hate to white people. He'd done it out of a sense of justice and fairness. Gandhi led the civil rights movement in, in India. He didn't do it out of hatred for the British. He often said that he, he wanted to free India and to leave British rule as friends with, as friends with uh, Britain. Uh, St. John Paul II, he led the campaign against communism in Poland, not out of hatred for communists, but because of a sense of justice. And Diane Abbott is someone who has shown 
um, in public life, a real sense of justice uh, and fairness for all uh, throughout her long political career. Uh, and if she's not ready to talk to uh, him at the moment, then I think she's entitled to have time and space uh, and to breathe and uh, to reassess where things are at a later date. Yeah, yeah. And um, Canon, your thoughts on, on this? If somebody wants to say sorry, um, uh, you know, and personally to you, and you just don't want a bar of it, is, is that mm. okay? Do you know, it, it, I said it was about relationships. A relationship takes time. Healing takes time as well. And when trust trust isn't there, when the relationship has been damaged and torn apart, whether it's in a political arena or in a personal arena, it takes a long time to get to that place. And sometimes the person who realises that they need to, to make reparation, actually the other person is also on that journey and it will take them time to get to that point. And I, I think perhaps all of us going back to our personal journeys, you know, our personal stories can think of times when we just aren't ready, you know, we just aren't ready to say, I, I can go back to being, you know, in, in that kind of relationship. It takes a long time. And sometimes it might never happen, you know, that the person is ready to receive forgiveness because that's their story. Uh, to work out what it means for them but you can continue that doesn't mean you shouldn't continue to offer and to stand by the apology and bear witness to it by the changed life that you live by how you do things that put things right in different ways and i think it's up it, it definitely as we've already said it's up to the individual how they feel that absolutely these things are terrible and we have too many people living under under threats whether in a public arena or in a personal arena um day by day and um, you know, it's a terrible place to be. So it's it's that rebuilding of relationship and it's a process. I think we forget that forgiveness is a process. It isn't an instant moment. It is with God. God forgives in an instant. But the process is learning to live differently. And that doesn't just happen in one split second. We learn to live that out in a relationship with one another and with God. So uh, hearing from both of you, am I right in saying that sorry is not just a word, it's a process, it's an action, it's a reparation of justice, it's, it's not a word to use unless you are truly sorry and ready to do something about it, Canon. I think in a in a in the church as says we're coming up towards that season when we're really thinking about that as Christians. I think we're talking about that kind of sorry that is built on repentance when we really are saying we have truly messed this up. Now, of course, little things that happen every day basis that we are just sorry about that we've done wrong, you know, from knocking some perhaps you know, knocking something over, forgetting to do something, we say sorry. But there is this big concept of it has to be more than just words. It has to be that repentance, that turning away and, and trying, and we would say with the grace of God, to live differently at this point. Thank you. And Father, your, your last word on this, sorry, isn't just a word to be casually used to get yourself out of a sticky situation. You've no, got to be ready to... Yeah, but, yeah, I would say that, but it, it is a process and it is a decision. It, it's, a, it's a decision to say, it's an act of wills to say, I'm prepared to move forward. And that can take a long time, depending on the situation, the person and the circumstances. Uh, so it's, it's really having an awareness of, of, uh, of all the factors involved. Thank you both for that. A really uh, fascinating uh, conversation. And uh, uh, you might want to comment on anything we've been talking about and, and forgiveness. Joining me today, uh, as you just heard, were Father Mark Lydon Smith, who's a Catholic parish priest, Seaham and Horton Le Spring in Durham, and Canon Sandra Miller, who's director of Mission and Ministry in Gloucester. Uh, let me tell you what's coming up on the show. Uh, we're going to be talking about another taboo, uh, a big taboo, the fact that most sexual abuse in families happens between siblings. It's something that's not talked about. It's it's something that, uh, in fact, there's uh, the second conference on it ever, only the second conference where people, uh, you know, psychiatrists and social workers, etc., got together. Uh, we've just had the second conference. It's something that's so taboo that usually the media don't talk about it. Well, you know me. Let's shine a light on it. Uh, the other thing we're going to be talking is loneliness. 
apparently if you're a young adult and you're lonely and you really really lonely for a long time it's an indicator of your employment uh, status and what will happen when it gets to the workplace it's a fascinating study we're going to be looking at that and those pictures those royal pictures um is it a sin to mess around with a photo because we all do it basically on social media uh the duchess of wales um graph we'll be talking to a celebrity photographer about that plus more of your calls and pour more of your messages uh remember you can have your say 0344 you can text the word talk to 8722 you can x at talk tv uh and i'd love to know how you feel about forgiveness and apologizing is the word sorry enough or do you need somebody who's done you wrong we'll be back with that and a whole lot more right after the break This is Talk TV. Three, two, one. Uh, go, Brown. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30. They go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious. Welcome back and thank you for joining me. Another packed uh, hour. We're going to be talking all things uh, Trump 
uh, in just a moment, seeing what's happening legally in the United States. Uh, also, we will be talking about, um, let me just see, photographs, that photograph. I'm so over that photograph of Catherine. Um, and also, um, children or young people who are lonely, it has an impact on how they or if they'll be employed when they're older, apparently. I, I never connected the two. We're going to find out in our Mind Matters segment uh, what's going on there. Got some messages about forgiveness, which we were just talking about with uh, our father and our canon. Uh, forgiveness. My mum always said that when you see two people get on, it's because one of them has come down i.e. two people standing at the top of two different mountains. Conversation across the chasm proves so difficult, so one descends to the valley below and the other follows. Now humility meets the other and can make a, su a suitable apology. That's the genuine remorse deserving of forgiveness and to give it freely. Uh, forgiveness. Hi, Tricia. I was appalled when you said you had had death threats. Indeed, I have some nice stuff here. You are a beautiful woman inside out caring, loving, and full of empathy. You've been through such a lot and still are. I, and I don't think anyone who has done that to you deserves forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you. Forgiveness. Hi, Tricia. Always lovely to see you on a weekend. Regarding forgiveness, I've had some pretty horrible things done to me in my life, but I've always been so forgiving, but not anymore. I've had some horrible treatment from some neighbours who have been really, who I've been really good to over the years. Jealousy, I've been told, is the reason. And no way will I ever forgive them. Enough, enough is enough. It's made me very vengeful, which I don't like. Penny from Essex. Penny, darling, Penny. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the anger that we feel for other people ultimately turns in on ourselves. It's a really difficult one, isn't it? Um, I'm glad that you can talk about it to me and your messages because the more we talk about these things the more we sort of chip away at them and and hopefully lessen their impact i'm really sorry you've been through such a t hard time we've been talking about saying the word sorry and forgiveness can you always forgive or are there some situations where uh it's not going to fly oh three double four four nine nine one thousand you can text the word talk to eight seven triple two you can x at talk tv um talking about forgiveness um feels a bit phony when I talk about our ne next uh, topic. Um, Mr. Trump, does one forgive and forget? Well, apparently not when it comes to the courts and all of the court cases he's got going, going on. Uh, who better to talk about that than Mark Schnapp, our brilliant US lawyer. I know many of you uh, uh, are very keen to hear the latest from him. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. There's so much going on legally in the US. Um, it's hard to know where to start. Which is the, do you, Which do you think are the big headlines? Is it... Fanny Willis and what's going on there? Is it um, him trying to Trump? I'll leave it to you. There's so much going on. Well, uh, there, you're right. There is an incredible amount going on. I think uh, obviously the Fanny Willis uh, matter has gotten a lot of attention. Although, you know what the irony is? Even though the, the judge um, gave her ultimately the, her office the choice whether to disqualify her or the lead prosecutor who she um, allegedly had an affair with. Um, you know, it's one of those things you got to be careful what you ask for because the guy was not qualified, in my opinion, to try a RICO case. So they disqualified a guy that shouldn't have been in the case in the first place. So, you know, what did they accomplish? Um, the judge said she can stay on, the, uh, Fannie Willis, the uh, district attorney, can stay on the matter. Her office isn't disqualified. And the only thing that they lost is a person who's not qualified in the first place, in my opinion. So that's that's case number one. Number two is the um, uh, documents case in Florida. And Judge Cannon ruled that um, his lawyer's argument that uh, the, the statute that he was charged with was uh, uh, void for vagueness didn't fly, uh, which she was frankly correct. Uh, and she's taken under advisement a second um, uh, argument that uh, that where which frankly I don't think flies either, but that he designated the records that he took as quote unquote personal, so therefore he was entitled to take them. 
that is absurd because they are national security documents. He cannot designate them as confident as, as personal records. And um, why she even gave it uh, uh, two seconds of thought is absurd to me. Um, but I, in my personal opinion, is that case is being slow walked. Um, you know, whether yeah. it's due to her, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, I was going to say, this is a judge as well. Uh, judge uh, um, Aileen Cannon is a judge that, uh, a, a, a Trump appointee as well. Um, I, I thought that was interesting. Um, but one of, of Trump's tactics clearly is, and it seems to be having some success, is in delaying all of these cases against him. Am I right? Oh, 100%. I mean, and that's the amazing thing. Frankly, as a lawyer, uh, that you have, uh, seeing that you have four indicted cases that can't move forward in, uh, in, in you know, and in, in, in four districts, you know, is, is a terrible um, commentary on our justice system. Uh, the New York case, which is the, quote, hush money case, which pushed back at least a month because at the last minute, the federal prosecutors who had declined that case um, gave the state uh, 75,000 pages of documents, which Ooh. now have to be reviewed by the defense. And why that couldn't have been done earlier, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But frankly, it's getting to be unlikely that any of these cases will be tried before the election. And so- Now what, I, so what, happens, now what happens, Mark, if, if Trump is re-elected, um, heaven help us all, but if Trump is re-elected, can those cases still go ahead? Can he still be called? Well, again, let's break them down. The, the two federal cases, he has a good chance of um, pardoning himself, which I know sounds absurd, but you can do that. Maybe, but the, no, it's never, nothing like this has ever happened before, needless to say. The two state cases, namely Georgia and New York, um, whether they can go forward or not is sort of ambiguous. I mean, whether there's no real precedent whether a judge can put off a case for this will be four years, um, uh, you know, if, if he from the time he's um, he enters his office to the time he leaves, um, I, they don't have to continue those cases, but I think there's a good chance that they will. So the bottom line is. You, you may never see these cases get tried, at least while he's the president, any of them. And what happens if he becomes president to all the money that he has to pay out in damages, the millions and, 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 and what have you? Can he get out of that? Does he still have to pay that? A hundred, yeah, absolutely has to pay that. Um, he posted a bond uh, while, he's, uh, while it's on appeal. Uh, well, there's multiple, there's more than one case. There's the... Uh, Gene Carroll uh, verdict, where he posted a bond, um, and uh, and there is the federal. Uh, I'm sorry, the state uh, case where that had to do with the valuation of his various properties, which is the now 450 million dollar uh, um, uh, damage claim. So the answer is no. He cannot avoid paying those. So it doesn't matter whether. It doesn't no, matter whether he. He still has to pay those. No, 100. Yeah, 100. percent The only thing that did happen on that is that one of the appellate judges in the New York courts did put a stay on the actions against him uh, being barred from being an officer or director of a New York corporation. Um, so, so that that is up, that is up in the air while the appeals go forward. But in terms of paying, I'm sorry. 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 Oh, Say, and what happens with his sons because uh, they've you know fallen foul of the law as well? If he appoints them to various positions, which I mean, there's a you know he's got history doing that. Do they squiggle out of any legal situations? No, no. The, the only thing that they have um, run afoul of is the New York uh, law, which uh, requires them to pay. I, I believe it's a million dollars or something like that. And they're also barred from uh, officer and director uh, positions. Uh, no, uh, if he appoints them to some uh, position and he, if he in fact is elected, uh, uh, no, they're still stuck. 
Wow. What other cases are going on that uh, that, that catch your eye? Uh, well, with, with Trump, um, yeah. 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 I, mean, I mean, look. I mean, I think uh, what's 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 troubling me is the the fact that the uh, Florida case, the documents case, is moving so slowly that uh, Judge Cannon. And again, I, let me give her the benefit of the doubt that she's not doing it to favor Trump. Okay, well, let's assume that she is um, maybe inexperienced in handling this complex a case. And it's really not complex. The only thing that makes it complex is the fact that the documents are classified and how you handle them in a trial adds a level of complexity. But in that case, should, she should have set a trial date by now. She should have had dates for the motions to be resolved. Um, the two motions that were argued this week, frankly, are just, in my judgment, silly. Um, uh, the New York case, uh, maybe that will get tried. Uh, uh, that's, the, that's the hush money case. The Georgia case is going nowhere. The uh, Washington, D.C. case, which is the election interference case, um, that case is, uh, well, this is, is, is going nowhere while the Supreme Court is resolving the presidential immunity issue. So I think the overall Trump strategy of delay, delay, delay is, is working. And I think it's very disappointing from a lawyer's point of view that four cases are going nowhere. And let's talk about something that Trump's talked about in the past. He talked about banning TikTok. Now, uh, federally, they are seriously talking about banning TikTok. Um, and now all of a sudden he says they shouldn't ban TikTok. What is the law that they're trying to pass? And why are they trying to, why is America trying to ban TikTok? Right. Well, the reason that the Congressional the Congress is trying to ban TikTok is because of the Chinese, um, uh, China, China owns TikTok, and they're concerned about the use of personal data uh, by the Chinese government. And in fact, there's law in China that requires uh, disclosure of personal information to the Chinese government. Whether that's really happening or not, who knows? But um, right now, and there are there's an investor group in particular by the former um, Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, uh, that they're trying to put together to buy um, TikTok. But anyway, your question was about Trump. He has flip-flopped on it. You're right. I mean, originally he, he wanted to ban it. Uh, now he wants to save it. And what his motivations are, you know, you never know. Um, but uh, but, but uh, uh, it may be because he wants to have Mnuchin buy it. Who knows? Ah, Who knows? yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, you never know what's going on behind him. And and just finally, I, I think it's a, a, an amazing story um, about uh, this young man. I don't know. Did you read this? This young man who's uh, sitting in his home somewhere in England, who apparently has amassed so much information on um, how Congress really works. And it it. What some of the people who follow him online, he's just a young chap from Poland. Some of the people online, uh, senators and what have you, do you think, I mean, it, it, what he's done is expose a real lack of legal knowledge amongst basically the people who are in charge of the country? Well, in all candor, he's right. There is a real lack of legal knowledge, including people who are lawyers. That's what's really extraordinary. I mean, if you look at some of the hearings that have taken place, you know, particularly, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't mention particular congressmen, but they are not acting, uh, you know, in, 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 as lawyers. They're acting in a totally extrajudicial uh, manner. And so, yes, I mean, I think he is exposing something that's frankly obvious. So you've got lawyers there who should know better but what, are you saying that the cases that they're bringing are so full of holes they shouldn't have been brought in the first place? The advice they're giving shouldn't shouldn't have been given? I'm sorry, the cases, the cases which cases? The cases well, look, that... Look, the, these uh, lawyers don't really know the law. Um, they're still advising people. They're still advising senators. Oh, no. What I'm saying is that a lot of the lawyers who are in Congress who are senators or, or congressmen, they oh, yeah. they ignore, I think, what the law is 
and don't believe it applies in uh, congressional hearings. That is fairly routine. And you could see it um, happen a lot. Um, you know, uh, and I, I think that whatever this, I, I'm not familiar with the story, to be honest with you, but I think what he is exposed is something that's obvious to someone who's trained in the law. So it, it's, it is disturbing. I mean, you have people who are making laws who don't know anything about the law. Yeah, I'm just thinking in, in a, a, the whole law about in Alabama about fetuses and what have you. I, uh, that decision is baffling. It seems to have been made by people who don't know the basics about biology, never mind the law. Well, you know what's really scary is that that particular judge who um, made the decision that a fetus is a, a living person um, wasn't guided by law. He was guided by quote unquote God, um, and uh, I don't know that you can cite God in terms of an opinion. Wow. Wow. That is really scary. That, yeah, that well, is really scary. Well, and that's really caused, even in Alabama, which is a very um, redneck state, it's caused a very bad reaction. Um, for example, the Alabama legislature has enacted a law that will basically preclude prosecution of people who are, um, or clinics that provide IVF services. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of the things that's really disturbing is the people who become judges, you know, and I've seen that, I've seen that all the time where people are unqualified to become judges <coughs> who are making these crazy decisions. And it, it's disturbing. It's very, very disturbing as a, as a lawyer and as a professional and, you know, in this case, the, the judge went too far in the Alabama but, but, case, he, too far. Here's a question. How do they, if, if they're unqualified to become judges in the states, how do they become judges then? Who who decides? Well, it varies depending on the state, but some, some states they're elected. Some states they're appointed. Um, some states, uh, you know, and, and for example, let's take Florida. If there's a vacancy, the uh, governor can appoint a judge, and then... Uh, that judge will have to be elected. And there's a lot of, and uh, there's a real debate as to whether the appointment of a judge is, is a better system than the election of a judge. I mean, both have their uh, defects. I mean, I'm not sure in Alabama how that judge became, um, who, who decided the uh, in vitro fertilization case became a judge, but whether he's appointed or elected, but he has no business on the bench, in my, again, in my judgment. Well, I, I guess he was appointed by God, <laughs> he would probably say. Uh, Mark, thank well, you I don't, so I don't know who you appeal that decision to, Tricia. So, uh... <laughs> I think we should all go to church and, and, and appeal it right away. Uh, Mark Schnapp, thank you so much for, for your time and that uh, catch up with what's happening. Tricia, well, thank you for having me. You're so welcome. What's happening on the legal uh, side when it comes to the United States? And yeah, they operate on a completely different way, or do they? Um, coming up, we're going to be talking about lonely young adults, uh, why we should be concerned about it. Back in a moment. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement. If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Thank you for joining me today. Remember, you can have your say about anything. 0344 499 1000. You can text the word talk to 87222. You can X at talk TV. Um, there's the information on the screen if you're actually watching us. Round about 35% of young people say they are chronically lonely. You might say who cares, but it actually has a socioeconomic cost, uh, according to a new study. New research from the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London, in partnership with the University of Greenwich, have uh, this research has been public in uh, Social Science and Medicine uh, magazine. It found that lonely young adults are more likely to be out of education, employment or training and consider themselves less employable and lower on the economic ladder uh, than their less lonely peers. Now, apparently, researchers have found out that young adults who had experienced loneliness earlier on in life had difficulties in young adulthood, even if they were no longer lonely. Um, researchers suggest that this demonstrates that loneliness impacts a person's long-term economic prospects and suggests that addressing loneliness in early adolescence could yield economic benefits through increased productivity now i keep coming back to the fact that the government has look is looking at this massive bunch of people who just aren't in work they can't seem to get them into work. Um, it's not for one huge reason. There are lots and lots of reasons. But surely this suggests that if a young person is lonely earlier on in life, then their prospects for e be e being in a job uh, diminish. Uh, what is this all about? Is it that people with problems are lonely and would be out of work anyway? Is is there a reason why so many people, young people are lonely? You might have some ideas why that might be. Do get in contact if you have. Um, but joining me now is Dr. Nihara Kraus, who is a consultant psychologist and is founder of a brilliant youth mental health char charity. Have a look at their website, STEM4, um, which helps uh, positive mental health for, for young people. Uh, Nihara, let's talk about uh, this research. And uh, uh, is it chicken and egg? Is it young people with maybe mental health issues who are lonely? Or is it lone, young people being lonely and therefore developing mental health? Not necessarily mental illness, but mental health issues. 
Um, I think that's a great question. I think it is circular, but it would probably be true to say that loneliness comes first, because what research indicates is that loneliness can lead to low self-esteem. It, uh, we as humans really have a real innate longing for connection. And so if our connection needs aren't met, then people are more likely to experience anxiety, to have increased rates of stress. Uh, it's seen as a major leader into depression. And of course, those conditions then, as you say, also create some sort of social withdrawal. Um, but essentially, loneliness is a very significant uh, factor in mental ill health. Can we define loneliness? Because there is a difference from, I guess, being alone and loneliness. How do you how do you look at a young person and say, no, that person is definitely lonely to a, a degree that will affect them? Well, loneliness is not a choice, whereas being alone is a choice. So people can choose or select to be alone on their own, and that isn't negatively impactful. But loneliness is when um, a person is longing for connection, but in reality, that need isn't met. They are isolated. Um, and can feel left behind or abandoned or different. So a whole range of very difficult and uncomfortable feelings. Yeah. yeah. Can we talk about what causes loneliness? Some people would say, especially these days, oh, it's social media and what have you. Um, having lived in a rural area in Norfolk, I can tell you sometimes it's a geographical loneliness. My kids, I mean, couldn't go in, in those areas. You can't walk often you can't walk to your uh, uh, somebody else's house or anything like that so what what are some of the reasons that young people are lonely because i know automatic people are going to say oh it's their fault they don't get off their backsides and go out is it bullying what what, what sort of things cause loneliness there are multiple there are multiple factors so geographical loneliness might be one of those things but it de depends on whether a person even when they might be in a rural area area have a sort of smaller community that they can connect with so starting something new can often generate a sense of often temporary loneliness, but you are in transit. So, for example, starting at university, starting a new job, starting in a new country or in a new area. Um, the experience of something that somebody else hasn't gone through. So something traumatic, for example, a major illness that might have impacted on you quite significantly that has then altered your whole developmental um, stages as you might go through um, being different to other people or your perception of how different you are can then impact on your ability to engage and connect. It's really true to say that those young people who are struggling with their sexuality or gender issues can end up feeling terribly lonely. Um, and young carers so if you are a carer and you are limited in your ability to go out and there has been an increase in loneliness that's been reported in young people particularly post the cost of living so if you can't afford to go out or to do the things that your friends might be doing then that creates a huge sense of loneliness as well as of course impacts on your sense of self-esteem and self-worth yeah, and uh, so uh, being on social media, is that ever an answer to to loneliness? loneliness? Can it increase feelings of loneliness? Yes, it can. So social media can be a very powerful tool uh, in terms of making connections. It's the way that young people do find their social networks. And certainly if you're one of those isolated groups I mentioned, it might be that it provides you with the opportunity to reach out and have those peer, peer connections. Um, however, what psychological research shows is that we really need to make our connections face to face if we are going to grow our social confidence. And social anxiety in particular can increase on social media because social media provides that opportunity to compare in a way that actually no other social connection provides. And 
if you are constantly comparing and constantly feeling like there is somebody ahead of you or has got something that's better than you, then that is enormously lonely. Uh, and the other thing, of course, that social media also provides is the opportunity to receive negative feedback and criticism in a way that you never receive face to face um, and also be ostracized. And that is enormously painful. So let's talk about the research and how it plays out, how, how loneliness plays out in later life. Even when somebody may no longer be lonely, it still affects them. Let's talk about how it affects them when it comes to employment. If you have experienced very long periods of loneliness, what that can do is it can bring about another type of loneliness. So if you have a social loneliness, it might lead to what's called emotional loneliness, which is a difficulty in making a close connection, a difficulty in trusting people, for example. Also, as you are growing up, the way that you learn about yourself, your sense of identity is formed through connecting with others, through realizing what makes you the same as, what makes you different and how you might want to be. And if you haven't had those experiences, then your sense of self, of who you are, hasn't really developed in a particularly positive way. And so even if socially you may no longer be isolated or lonely, you will still carry those emotions and that awkwardness about who you are with you. So here's a million dollar question. As a parent, I'm sure many parents have recognized that their teen is lonely, spending hours in their bedroom or all that sort of thing. Come on, get out, do something. I mean, <laughs> And that person may have developed social anxiety because it seems to me the longer you're in that situation, the scarier just going out is going to be. What do you do as a, as a parent? It's so difficult as a parent, isn't it? Because you really want your child or young person to expand their social circle, to be confident social uh, beings. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that part of growing up is that you do need periods of time on your own. You do need that that choice that I mentioned before of being able to say, I'm separate, I'm different to family, please give me a little bit of downtime. But if you are a parent and you are concerned because you know that your child or young person is feeling isolated, is unhappy about who they are, might be spending hours online, might not be sleeping that well because they feel so sad about who they might be, then I think it's really about having some conversations. So reach out and make it light touch. See it as a series of conversations that you're going to have and not so much about asking them why, because often young people will be too embarrassed or too ashamed sometimes to say that perhaps they have difficulty making friends. So I just suggest, you know, do some activities together, have some open conversations about what it is that enables them to make those connections. As parents, you are in important role models. So I think explore how sociable you might be. And it might be that you need to start to model that sociable connection, particularly if you're somewhere new, for example, if it's a new school or a new area, then create those social connections yourself. Encourage them to follow a passion. So if they're really interested in something, provide them with that opportunity to do that. If it's difficult to make those connections at school or college, then it might be that they can have after school clubs that they can join or other activities that they can do. And certainly, I think there's something about the generosity of giving to others. So if you're volunteering, if you are able to feel good about yourself in multiple different ways, then that really does help with regards boosting self-esteem and confidence and feeling less alone. And some great ideas there. Just you know, I, I, personally, I think music or learning to play an instrument. Um, one of my kids was ostracized, if you like, and I got them into after school. I mean, what you're saying is like I'm like saying, oh, you know, it was trial and error, but because they played an instrument so well got them into uh, actually it was a woman's collective so there were a lot of women older than than you know my kid was but 
it gave them someone to talk about music rather than themselves. I think if a young person can talk about their passion more it's it's less scary than talking about themselves and i just think musical instruments are a fantastic way of telling people how you feel without words if that makes sense i completely agree i think that not everyone has words so if you can express yourself you know through music acting Thanks. writing art there's so much available connect and the other thing is connecting with nature so sometimes people might feel less lonely less lonely if they are able to connect with nature in different ways so really reach out i'd say it's some really really brilliant advice and brilliant information there uh, i just want to tell people because i did have a look at it stem four uh, has so many resources. Can you tell us a little bit about it and how people can learn more. STEM4 is, is the leading UK's mental health charity providing mental health tech for young people. So one of the, the things that we do know is that mental health services are stretched and yet young people's mental health uh, is increasing in terms of mental ill health. So what STEM4 provide? are a whole range of digital evidence-based mental health apps. They're free uh, to anybody in the UK. They're approved by the NHS and they help young people to manage some of those early symptoms. If you're stressed, if you're anxious, if your mood is low, if you need a little bit of motivation, then uh, those apps will help you and support you in terms of then reaching out to get some extra help if that's the way you want to go. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I love anything that talks to people in a way that they can digest that information. And as you say, yeah, you don't get me started on uh, young people's mental health services. I mean, when you talk about neglect, they're probably at the bottom of the pile and they're the most needed. So I just absolutely applaud you. And I, uh, we will be contacting you again in the future because I just want to get the message out that it's all too important. Uh, Dr. Nihara uh, Kraus, uh, founder of STEM4, consultant psychology and absolutely... You know, if you're young, if you know a young person who's struggling, it's not something to poo poo and write off. It's something to sort of, if I can say, nip it in the bud very gently. And as you heard there, STEM4 has got some brilliant ways of uh, of doing it, something you might want to signpost to that young person. Uh, I'm going to take a break. We will be back uh, in a moment to talk about that photo. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. joining us uh, again um and thank you for watching i do have I, i've got to say it i'm going to boast i have a brilliant audience out there i really do i really do um a message about u.s politics we were just discussing that with mark schnapp uh the u.s lawyer is right and i also strongly believe that before these members of uh power become judges etc who are not qualified anyone in high power needs to be first assessed by criminal criminal psychologists to diagnose whether they have npd narcissistic personality disorder or similar unhealthy disorders or worse as we seem to be seeing an epidemic of people in power displaying signs of npd and it's very very dangerous for the world. We need to ensure that those in an, an authority are healthy minded and go through proper assessments first. We're just about to talk about the Princess of Wales and that photo. I mean, it goes on and on. Uh, Trisha, read the Princess of Wales. I think that she should be able to recover from her operation at home with the family. I do not think we should be told what the operation was. That is her private medical history. Agreed. Great show again today. Thank you, Susie, that lovely message from Susie. Um, but let's talk about that photo because everybody's talking about that photo. I feel I should dedicate this segment uh, to a lady called Arlene. She's a, a relative of my husband's and she rang up and asked about what the photo is. I think the photos, that photo uh, has been talked about more in the USA. I don't know. Is it? <laughs> Why is it such a big thing? That's the first question I'm going to ask my lovely next guest, who I've known for flipping years. He's like the best photographer out there. He gets called a celebrity photographer, but he's more than that. Nikki Johnson joins me now. Nikki. Hi, Trisha. Hello. This photograph, right? Oh. The, <laughs> all right. Let's, I'm going to ask you the obvious, obvious questions. Why touch it up there would have been things in that photo uh, uh, of uh the, the princess of wales released on mother's day last sunday everybody's like oh i love this photo and then ah all the news agencies start dropping it um so loads of questions to ask you about it why wouldn't why does a news agency drop a photo if they feel it's been touched up or manipulated because it seems to me just about every flipping celebrity photograph has been touched up or manipulated well yes exactly and they mostly are but i think the difference with this picture was is because she'd she'd put the children in or changed the position or the facial expressions of the children and that's where it's gone horribly wrong because she'd obviously comped in better images of the kids. You know what it's like when you're doing kids. One's pulling the tongue, one's looking that way, one's not looking at the camera. And I think what she's done is she's changed the, the kids in the picture, but done it really badly. And it's very but easy to do. Gonna... I've done it. Nikki, I didn't realise that. I just thought it was the hand there or the finger there. I think You think, are you saying from a photographer's point of eye, that she's actually put different pictures of the kids in. Yes, I believe the picture was taken at the same time, but she probably didn't get the best one with them all in it. So if you look at the picture, what you happen, imagine the original image is there, and then she's got a different picture of Charlotte and Plonky on top, and then you rub out 
the bad image with a brush. But the thing is, she's missing bits. And that's why the skirt didn't join up. And the hands are slightly different on Charlotte's wrist. And oh, I think... See, I you know, didn't miss that. I missed that. I just thought it was she just messed around with bits and pieces. I, I didn't realise that she used different images. Why would you put out a photo without your wedding ring? You know that's going to get everybody screaming and shouting. Well, I know, but you know what it's like? Look, Trisha, I'm not wearing my rings today. They wouldn't go on. Some days it's really uncomfortable to wear a ring. I know she's the Princess of Wales. It's a different situation. But... You know, or she's actually rubbed the ring out when she was doing the pictures by mistake. The brush might have been too big and she's gone like that. I don't, you know, unless you go around every single section of that picture to check yeah. what you've done, it's very easy. You become blind to it when you're looking at it on the screen. And of course, when the picture's the normal size, it looks fine. I didn't notice any mistakes when I looked at it. It's only when you zoom in, and that's obviously what the picture agencies have done, and there, then this conspiracy theory comes up. Was she even there? Is this an older picture of her that she's brought in? And I actually don't believe it is. I think because the lighting on her face, some people are saying it's the picture from the Vogue cover. Well, I've looked at the Vogue cover and the lighting's totally different and her makeup is totally different. So I think right. the picture was taken at the same time. She's just changed the kids to make the nicest picture possible. I mean, it's not a crime. It's not a crime, but, it, you know, as, isn't she patron of the photographic uh, society? You sort of think, oh, no. <laughs> well, I know. Yes, it's embarrassing. She's obviously not very good at Photoshop. And that's a complicated thing to do if you're not used to using Photoshop. But, you know, give her a due. She admitted it. She said, I've, look, I've played around with it and that's what's gone wrong. But of course, it, so, it just creates this whole conspiracy theory of was she really there? Is she really ill? Where is she? All of this uh, drama. You know, the woman just needs some time off. I, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Now, let's talk about, as I touched right upon the, right at the beginning, uh, part of us, well, part of me, says, what's the big deal? I, I, I'm going to stick my neck out and say very few celebrity photos go out without being retouched. Yes, exactly. But I think the problem, I think if she hadn't been missing for however long she's been missing, as they keep saying, that wouldn't have been an issue because they would have seen her the day before at some event or, you know, at a party or whatever. And I think right. that's the problem. Because she hasn't been seen, that's when all the conspiracy comes in. Well, what's really wrong with her? I mean, she's probably just bloody exhausted. I mean, what a horrible life to have. I mean, oh, yeah. can you imagine going to all those events every single day of your life and shaking hands with horrible people? I mean, horrible life. She's probably laying down in a dark room trying to recover. But listen, here's the thing. I mean, they're now saying when she goes out, oh, those horrible times, meeting all those horrible people, she might let slip. Because there's always someone to say, oh, you're glad you're out about, what about that photo and all that sort of thing. But um, let's let's talk about this. We seem to think of doing stuff to photos. And, you know, now there's all sorts of lenses on, you know, all sorts of apps and all that sort of thing. And on social media, everybody messes around with their photos. Yes. It's not, not something new, though, is it? Photos no, have been I never, touched all the time. I don't quite get this, because nobody seems to really like to talk about it. But, I mean, the majority of people always want something done. I mean, you on this occasions where you can't touch up, like I did a, a skincare brand, and you're not legally allowed to touch the skin. Even if you remove oh, a right. spot of dust from someone's jumper, you have to circle it and write what you've done. And I think that's fair enough, because if you're selling a cream that's going to make you look 12, you can't then use a photoshopped image. So and yeah. in those circumstances, but I mean, everyone likes to look better. We all have filters on our phone, some ridiculous, some quite useful. You know, and I think this whole hoo-ha, oh, the picture's been retouched. Well, every picture in the world has probably been retouched now. Mm -hmm. But no one wants to admit it. No, we don't want to admit it, but it's not. I mean, what I'm saying is it's not new. Before all of these apps, way, way, way back, 
they people were were messing around with photos it might have taken a lot longer in dark rooms and what have you but we seem to think of it as a modern phenomenon but really i'm sure there's lots of famous pictures or historical pictures going all the way back to princess diana going all the way back to the invention of photography where absolutely things they used to put negatives together to get two different images or place images in the print as they were enlarging it you know it goes back a long way it's just a lot easier now more accessible to people on their phones and every app that they've you know a device they've got so uh, the shock that it's been retouched and all this hoo-ha Yes, she's put different kids in, but big deal. You know, who wouldn't? If you had a family photograph taken, you'd want the best pictures of your kids in that picture if it's going out to the whole world. Yeah, Unfortunately, yeah. she messed up and she's crap at Photoshop. It should have been, should have been, <laughs> it should have been picked up by. Her PR people, surely. I mean, I have to say, time and time and time again, I and many, many people think, who are these PR people that the royals hire? I mean, you know, as I I, I, I comment a lot on it with CNN, and so many times internally I'm rolling my eyes, saying an amateur PR person could do better than this. Well, I think in her defence, they've probably said to her, look, we need a new picture to go out of you and the kids because everyone's wondering where the hell you've gone. She's handed them this digital image of the thing and they might not well have zoomed in. They wouldn't think to maybe zoom in on the skirt or the hand. If you look at that image straight off, as I did when it first came out, it's just a nice family picture. And they've right. not thought, ooh, what has she done here? What has she done there? Because she might not have told them. And off yeah. it goes to the world. So all this hoo-ha about how they should sack the press office, I think is also a bit high-handed. Because they might not well have zoomed in. I mean, they will now, from now on. I was going to say. Is this real? <laughs> They'll be like, is this real? Is this real? Um, and the, the, um, the other thing is, I think they're probably not as up to date as with the rest of us uh because they use a proper camera so many people don't now that it's all That's... on their phone isn't it i mean the fab thing is she is actually a very good photographer she's captured some lovely reportage shots of the kids you know we're used to the very formal royal photographs and she's brought a different side to it which is mm. delightful a bit like diana did but she had a, her own photographer she commissioned um, so she actually has, she is a good photographer, but maybe she just needs a few lessons in Photoshop so that she can do it again, but it won't go out in the state it did. But I'm happy you to show... go around and help her if she wants. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give, you, give her your number. No, but should, should people Photoshop things? I mean, why... Why do we always have to present the best? Because historically, especially if you're a royal family or if you're, I mean, you know, Diana or the Kennedys or something, historically, wouldn't it be better to give people the true image rather than an airbrushed image of, of history? Because this is history. It is, but I don't, we're not saying that she's retouched her face. That's a different thing. You know, she's not, she might have done a little bit of eye bag work. I've no idea because I wasn't there and I haven't seen the original. But if she did, is it a big deal? Like, who would want a picture to go out where you don't look your best? Yeah. I don't. I don't think that's a crime. Maybe I'm in the minority, but I think I know if I have to ever do a picture, it's airbrushed to hell. <laughs> I, look, I look about twelve in my passport picture. Yeah. Do you know. Hang on, I've got. A I've got a message for you. Uh, oh, on Kate, cool. your, celebrity, your celebrity photographer guess is funny. And I agree. I feel sorry for Kate. But it's the only one, it, it's only the ones on social media who get nothing else to do that want to criticise anything and anyone. The ones with the biggest mouths, but not everyone is on social media. I think people forget that. There's a majority of the public that don't use social media because they don't need it or they look at uh, it for the purpose it was originally intended to keep in touch with friends and families, not to moan about every man and his dog. How sad. They need to leave Kate alone and let her her edit her photos if she wants there you are you got someone agreeing absolutely with you. 
Well said. <laughs> I don't know who that was. When you're as, as famous as she is, why would you send a picture out with eye bags and spots when you can get rid of them in a second? Oh, and I guarantee you, if you did a poll in the whole country, I bet 99% of people would say, yes, please retouch me. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, people like Marilyn Monroe, even all of those people had their photos uh, touched up Always in touched. some... All right, so here's the question for you. Uh, not Photoshop, because obviously it's really difficult to use. Is it difficult to use? It's not difficult. It just takes time to learn. I mean, and what she did was quite a complicated thing. And I've done it and oh. made a mistake as well and had a picture sent out with no foot on someone. <laughs> and I went into the TV company. It was blown up 60 by 40 on the wall. It was a group of 10 people. And I said, oh, my God, where's Frank's foot? And I'd forgotten. I'd brushed the foot out. And nobody had noticed. And it'd been up for a month, 60 by 40 inches on a wall. And this guy's standing there with no foot. No foot. So no foot. Um, it, it, this guy, Frank, who had no foot, he obviously didn't like, couldn't drink milk and couldn't eat tree, cheese ah, because ah, he ah, had those, ah, he had those. Ah, ah, ah. Run out of time. And on that note, darling, darling, uh, oh. Nicky Johnson. We'll have to call it quits. Nicky Johnson. Oh, lovely. Then. Love photographer, love talking to you. Celebrity photographer talking about why we shouldn't be so bothered about Kate. What we've got coming up is a sibling sexual abuse, something that's not talked about at all, and Ramadan and fasting. All of that and a lot, lot more right after this. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, Trico. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. A trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. just happened being on talk tv every friday night at 10 30 they go and change it i'm furious they've moved it to 8 30 every friday talk tv what just happened i am furious thank you for joining me for a hot last hour uh, Ramadan Mubarak, um, it's uh, Ramadan and people are fasting all over the world. So we're going to be looking at fasting um, because it's also something that's growing as a, I don't know, uh, outside of the religious aspect. It's one of the, fasting is one of the five uh, pillars of Islam. Outside of that, fasting is increasing in popularity. Why? What good does it do? Can it help you? Health, uh, are there good ways to fast and bad ways to fast? We'll be looking at that. Also, in our I Believe, you, if you recall, every so often I do a segment called I Believe, where we invite somebody on to talk about what it is they believe. Um, we have George the Medium. He speaks to spirits what he believes and why he believes it we'll be talking about that a little bit later but our first subject is is something uh it's another taboo right at the beginning of the program we talked about taboo uh, another taboo uh which is men being on the receiving end of uh domestic violence and we actually had somebody uh call in and talk about very bravely talk about their own experience and how difficult it is to talk about because uh there's a belief that only women uh, goes through domestic abuse. Um, there's another myth that I'm going to uh, bust for you right now. It's something that the press ordinarily does not talk about. And that is, let, let me give you this, this statistic first. Siblings are responsible for more sexual abuse of children than any other family member. That's a fact. Studies indicate that a child is three to five times more likely to be abused by an older sibling than they are by a father or stepfather. They tend to be younger. The abuse tends to go on longer. And the abuse is generally not, uh, doesn't come to light until the abused person is aged 40. Now, if the press does report on it, they're not allowed to divulge that there are siblings involved. It's got to be child X and child Y. How it occurs, why it occurs, and what's going on when it is the leading cause of abuse, not that stranger, not uh, the, the world that is bandied about on the, in the internet all the time. It's not some strange pedophile. It's not the father. It is a sibling who is most likely to abuse a child. You can start to think about, start to imagine all of the reasons why we don't talk about that. Uh, joining me now is somebody who is, is, is uh, I've had a look at the body of his work. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, he's director of the Lucy Faithful Foundation in Scotland. Do have a look at their website. And if you are going through this or have been through this, because by the very nature, it's some 5% of, of children are reported, uh, tip of the iceberg, tip of the iceberg. But if you're affected by any of this, and I will give out information again at the end of the programme, I do uh, point you to the, uh, have a look at the Lucy Faithful Foundation online. Um, 
my next guest is is a director of that group. He qualified as a social worker. He's worked with young people who have displayed harmful sexual behaviour for over 20 years. Currently chair of the National Organisation for the Treatment of Abuse in the UK and Ireland. Formerly chair of that group in Scotland. Uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, Stuart Allardyce joins me to discuss a topic that is rarely discussed. Stuart I was, when I read this and I had a look at the Lucy Faithful Foundation, I, like I'm guessing many people listening and watching, was totally shocked. Now, just to blow away some of the furfies, we're not talking about kids playing doctors and nurses here. Can we talk about what the subject at hand really is all about? Uh, thank you, Tricia, and um, um, good to be with you. But we are talking about um, an incredibly serious and and and, and distressing subject. Um, so we're we're talking about um, sexual behaviour between children that causes significant harm for those children who are victimised going through childhood and 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 indeed into in, into adulthood. Um, so you know. As you've said, when we normally think about child sexual abuse, we normally think about abuse perpetrated by adults, but we actually know that a significant amount of sexual abuse is perpetrated by particularly adolescents themselves. Um, but when we even when we think about that, which is almost unthinkable in itself, we very rarely think about sexual abuse within families. But yes, and it's, siblings are uh, more likely to be sexually abused um, than, than being abused by, by um, uh, a parent. And I'm guessing that it's so uh, the layers of difficulty. I mean, when you think about it, for a parent to even think, to even contemplate that uh, would be uh, to even know what the signs are. Are there, we all like to think, oh, there's particular families it happens within. Is there any pattern of that? Or are there, do there just need to be conditions where it can happen to any family, regardless of socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera? So the important thing to get across is that it, it, it can affect any family. Um, and we need to be absolutely clear about that. But but there are some risk factors in all of the, this as well. So we know that, that, that children who display these behaviours, who act in these abusive ways to usually young, younger, younger siblings, um, uh, will often have been exposed to sexual things themselves that they weren't ready for. That might be that they have already been sexually victimised by somebody else. Um, but it might be just exposure to uh, adult sexual behaviour or in particular pornography. Uh, we also know that it's more likely that these kind of issues occur in families where there are other kinds of maltreatment or other kinds of um, kind of challenges going on. Um, but it can affect any challenge, any family. And, and uh, as you say, it can be incredibly overwhelming for parents to discover this. The first family I worked with where this was an issue, this is maybe um, uh, almost 25 years ago, um, I remember the mother saying to me that actually it was like a grenade going off in the middle of their family. So, I mean, rather than look at black and white, would I be right or am I wrong? What, yeah, thinking that the child who is the abuser clearly has some issues as well. Are we talking about two victims, obviously not parallel, but what have you, when you treat a family or you, you deal with a family like that, are we talking about li literally criminal and, and innocent goodies and baddies or two victims? The, the 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 world is really kind of black and white. I mean, the first thing to 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 get across is that all the individuals here are children. Yeah, They're children first and foremost. Um, so even that language of victim and perpetrator, I would I would kind of gently push back on 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 that. And you know, we 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 as you know professionals, social workers, mental health practitioners, we'd often talk about the child who has been harmed and the child who has done the harming, um, just to try and kind of break this down a, a, a little bit and also to recognize actually you know many of the children not all but many of the children who do display these behaviors have experienced some form of abuse or harm themselves mm -hmm. 
and and do they if not discovered um and it's interesting that uh, that this study showed that victims tend to only talk about it when they get to adulthood um and they tend to grow up thinking what they went through as with many kinds of abuse is quote unquote normal but what happens to the you know the harmer if you like the child who's creating the harm do they go on to become rapists or what have you or do they face psychological issues themselves in later life like guilt etc i mean to be to, to to be frank trisha we, we we lack good data on this but um we we know quite a lot about children and young people who display kind of abusive or harmful sexual behaviors generally um, so we have a whole slew of studies that tell us that the majority of those children do not grow, on, grow up to be adult um, sex offenders. A tiny minority do, so we need to absolutely get the right kinds of supports to make sure that those, those people get absolutely the right, the right, right kinds of support. Um, um, but the, the, we're not talking about many adult sex offenders. However, um, um, having worked with adults who talk about having harmed a sibling in childhood it can it indeed leave um, um, uh, those who have caused the harm with distress with shame with mental health issues but we also need to recognize that the, all, the, those issues around shame and 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 uh, harm also sit with the the person who has been harmed and indeed other members of the family as well you know mums dads, siblings who have not been abused can all be profoundly affected by this. Does it, and, and for the child that's been abused, um, I'm, I'm thinking the, the same complications when it, if it's a father or a stepfather, but the same complications would be in love. I mean, that that's the other thing. The world likes to see the world in black and white. You must hate that person. But often these abuse situations, you, you love your brother or your, your sister, you love them and yet this occurs it 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 it's must be really difficult and you said that mother said it was like a grenade going off it must be really difficult to recognize that your your big brother that you, who you love at one stage but have all these other feelings of shame guilt anger as well yeah that, that, i mean that that that's absolutely right right and i think um um it is it's 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 complex. Um, it pans out in different ways um, in in different families, of course. Um, child sexual abuse is is, is generally um, often not disclosed in childhood um, for a whole host of reasons, ranging from shame through to coercion on the part of the uh, the abuser through to the relationship that the um, the, the 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 victim has with the uh, the abuser. Sibling sexual abuse is even less likely to be disclosed than other forms of, of, of child sexual abuse. Um, and indeed, I think one of the, the key things here is that many people who have experienced uh, sexual harm from another sibling will often struggle to even think about what they've experienced as being child sexual abuse. But it is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So are there things a parent you know we talk about crossing boundaries and uh, very often these things happen in families where boundaries in some other form have been crossed what sort of things to you would you say a, a bit red flag I'm, I'm thinking of an older sibling sharing a bedroom with a younger sibling or whatever but but what are the things if a parent is is scared or doesn't even want to contemplate that happening what are the mistakes they could innocently be making that might help facilitate um, to, to the situations we're talking about? Well, I mean, you, you, you've already mentioned some of it. I mean, um, um, uh, things around um, kind of siblings of different ages um, uh, kind of sharing rooms together. I and mean, sometimes that that is, of course, absolutely unavoidable. But um, it is one of the things that, that that comes up in some of the cases that that that, that we see. I think um, I mean there are um, um, get, going back to 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 where you started. The, your first question is it was saying that this isn't just normal kind of sex, uh, curiosity between uh, sexual curiosity between between children, and it's not. But but um, sometimes we see kind of natural curiosity between siblings that then moves to behaviour that 
is perhaps inappropriate but not abusive you know stuff that might be you know um uh, siblings kind of touching each other in various ways um uh, particularly if they sh share the same bedroom um and that can um uh, kind of develop and in, in, in indeed escalate over 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 time to behavior that then becomes let's be frank kind of penetrative sexual sexual acts uh particularly you know when, when we have the influence of online pornography for for for, for children and so forth so my, my advice would be that that if you you know identify any kind of issues with with with, with a, within your own family um it's not to say that that what you're identifying is necessarily abusive um but um there is anonymous and confidential helpline support that's out there which means that you can just have a chat about what's going on with colleagues who have good understandings of these kind of issues who can provide some advice and support and we, we should tell people where they can go you you mentioned there are confidential lines such as so, so the, the, we 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 um um uh, 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 are behind the the Stop It Now UK helpline, which is completely anonymous and confidential for anyone who has any concern around child sexual abuse, including stuff around sibling sexual abuse. Uh, our, our number is 08 08 1900 for anyone who is either affected by by this as a, a live issue in their family at the moment or they're considering actually something that happened to them many years ago but are looking for an opportunity to talk that through that 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 would be a good starting point and, and just to finish off we had a message earlier um where somebody said and we were talking about men being um on the receiving end of domestic abuse and somebody said look if there's children involved um you know they can understand a man sec uh, staying with a woman who was physically abusing him but if there weren't any children uh don't go to the police just leave so for families if you know if it's intermarital you'd say go to the police but i'm just thinking for a family where there's sibling sexual abuse going to the police is like a double grenade would you suggest they still do that is that a first port of call or is it more about help for those involved I, I, it, it, it's 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 a good good question, and uh, I mean the, the the quick answer is that that different individuals and different families need to find their own solutions. So 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 you know some people who have been affected by this issue have gone to the the, the criminal justice system, and and sought redress there kind of kind of successfully. Uh, but for many families, that's not what they're looking for. Actually, um, they're wanting some kind of support and some kind of help. But something that that sits out out with the criminal justice system, and 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 a way of at least accessing some of that support initially would be through things through like um, uh, anonymous and confidential helplines. Thank you, thank you. And as I said before, right to to come full circle, it is a it's a taboo subject. I don't even have to ask why. It's that got that icky factor, hasn't it? It's got that. Um, you know, it, it, it's very un-Disney-like to think about that. Um, but it is something, would you agree, it is something that we need to talk about. I was shocked that there's only been two conferences. Um, it, it's still something that people don't like to say out loud, isn't it? We need to talk about it more. Um, we need better training for frontline um, uh, professionals working in safeguarding and child protection. We need um you know uh probably a national resource where those who are affected by the, these issues including adult um mums and dads maybe kind of years on who are kind of struggling with these kind of issues can go and get the right kinds of uh help and support we, we need to bring this issue out of the shadows but in doing that we need to make sure that the right kinds of helps and help and and, and, and supports are there for for families and and children and adults who are affected by this Thank you so much. As I said, it's a difficult subject, but I'm I'm glad uh, that we've had the opportunity to to bring it out into the open, even just a little bit. Um, it's something that definitely does need to be talked about. Thank you so much. Um, that's Stuart Allardyce uh, talking with us there, director of the Lucy Faithful Foundation in Scotland, and that's somewhere else you can go for for more information and we've been talking about uh siblings sexually abusing each other it is uh the family member most likely to sexually abuse a child in in britain 
is their own brother or sister. We just don't like to talk about it. I hope. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from King City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Thank you for joining me. You can't say that we don't do lots and lots of, of different subjects. Uh, one of our regular Sunday uh, bits is Doctor in the House, which is coming up. And at the end of the show, we're going to be talking to George the Medium. So maybe you have a spirit you want him to get in touch with. Maybe you want to ask a question. Maybe you just have something to say. So let me remind you of the numbers to call. 0344-499-1000. You can ring that or WhatsApp it, apparently. You can text the word TALK to 87222. Or you can X at TALK TV. Uh, if you've got a question for our next guest, we're going to be talking about fasting. Uh, there's a number on the screen. We're going to be talking about fasting. Or you might, if you want, George the medium to talk to you about a, a departed one. We're going to be talking about what he believes. I'm not saying we all believe it, but we're going to talk about what he believes. I uh, got a message here already. Loneliness, loneliness. Remember, we were talking with that really amazing subject about young people and loneliness. Loneliness. Some people experience loneliness as a result of being excluded from parties held by siblings or other relatives and memories of bullying can affect teamwork, which most employers and college courses expect. COVID-19 has, in my view, made lots of people shrink back further. Uh, you are right. The evidence, the, the studies have shown that. 
Uh, COVID-19 has, in my view, made lots of people shrink back further and more problems are then created as a result. It's even become difficult for people to go back to church services. You're right, social anxiety has uh, sprung up. As a, uh, as a result of, of uh, COVID-19, people uh, having no other family members and being isolated for long amounts of time and your brain starts thinking and you start getting... I I'm, come on, admit it. Most of us felt a bit funny going back into social situations post-COVID. Um, yeah, I think most of us, when we were still aware, especially if you've had COVID once, I, I don't want to get it again. Um, but if you want to talk about that, as I said before, you might want to talk to, uh, to uh, George, the medium, about a departed loved one you want to get in contact with. 0344-499-1000. Uh, you can text the word TALK to 87222. You can X at TALK TV. I have to say... I have to say, because that's what I have to say, because I'm a broadcaster, as far as George the Medium, it's about what he believes, his beliefs. We're not saying it's true or untrue or anything like that. We're not peddling it as, as fact. You just might be curious, as am I. That's why we have our I Believe uh, segment. So let's talk uh, to, about our, our Doctor in the House subject, Ramadan is um it started on the 11th of march monday the day after mother's day it finishes on wednesday the 10th of april and millions of muslims in uh, the uk around the world are observing the holy month of ramadan uh, it's about fasting it's also about reflection it's about community and it's about family time uh, it's a good time to bring up the subject of fasting it's something that's become increasingly popular um and if you are fasting during ramadan is there a good way to fast is there a good way to break fast uh all of those questions i thought it would be a really good time to ask our next guest dr adam collins is a nutritional a consultant he specializes in intermittent fasting and metabolism in fact he's published research on the effect of fasting on glu glucose and lipid metab uh, meta metabolism it might help if i could actually say the word he's a qualified nutrition for over 20 years he's also an associate professor of nutrition at surrey university he joins me now um dr collins let's talk about fasting is there a good way to fast and versus a bad way to fast that's a bit of a loaded question so i mean i suppose when we think of fasting, we are thinking more popular now about intermittent fasting. But I suppose one of the earliest forms of fasting is religious fasting, which is obviously Ramadan being a good example of that, which you could argue is uh, a very old form of time-restricted mm -hmm. eating, which is a very popular form of intermittent fasting. Um, so in answer to your question, is there a good or a bad way of fasting? I suppose um people argue about what how long you should fast for and um what you should do during that fast should you totally abstain from eating everything and just have plain water should you do that for several days should you do it for one day or a couple of days a week should you do it for several hours within every day um so there's lots of different modes of, of fasting and one of the things around intermittent fasting is that it's a uh, i suppose it's a more user-friendly more practical mm. and potentially safer way of fasting rather than just totally abstaining for days on end all right so what what do we mean when, what 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 do we mean when we talk about intermittent fasting what what is it so it, it's it's a way in which you're fasting on and off so you're doing periods of fasting and periods of normal eating usually so um, the so Ramadan is a, is a form of that, but I suppose the popular intermittent fasting recently is the um, five two type diet, where you're fasting or eating very little on two days out of seven, um, which mm -hmm. sort of stemmed from early research on alternate day fasting, where you're fasting on one day and then not on the next, um, and then time restricted eating is where you're fasting not necessarily for a whole day but within a 24-hour period you're extending that sort of fast overnight so you're 
eating only a, in a short window of, of time, usually less than 12 hours, typically around eight hours of that 24 hours. So you're so, extending that fast. So, you're, you know, you're talking about maybe having, you know, breakfast, if you have breakfast at eight, having your last meal of the day, maybe at six or, or eight. What, why do it? I mean, is the primary reason, it's got to be the primary reason is for what, weight loss, keeping your weight down, or are there other benefits? Well, the, I suppose the, it reached popularity because um, it was a way in which people could lose weight. Because yeah. if you were doing, say, the 5-2 or alternate day fasting, you're eating so little on those fast days that even though you might be overeating on the other days, you couldn't compensate. So overall, you're having uh, like a calorie deficit. And it sort yeah. of works out similar deficit to what you would do if you're eating just 500 calories a day less every day. So it's like comparable weight loss just without actually having to count any calories. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's that's obviously one benefit of it. Now, what comes with weight loss is lots of other health benefits. So when if you are overweight or, or have obesity, then losing that weight obviously improves things like insulin sensitivity, reduces your risk of cardiovascular disease, as also other health benefits uh, that go with that. Um, but I think the thing that I'm more interested in and where intermittent fasting starts to go now is that it, there's other metabolic effects of fasting, irrespective of whether you're losing weight. So when you look at things like time-restricted eating or indeed Ramadan, which is obviously an example of that, you might not necessarily lose any weight, but that way in which you're transitioning from periods of being of eating and periods of uh, extended periods of not eating can have mm. quite metabolic effects. Oh, in, in, in what way? What, just to explain that to us. Yeah, so if you think that most of the time you are in a, a fed state, what we say, particularly in a Western world, you know, people wake, wake up and you know, they're eating or drinking something and then they're eating maybe not just meals, but snacks in between meals and drinks, and then eating possibly late into the evening. So in terms right. of their metabolic state, there's almost like in a fed state all the time. And that's yeah. generally meaning that they're using carbohydrate, they're using blood sugar, relying on that pretty much most of the time. But right. the idea of creating the fast is, or, or where you're reducing that eating window or giving yourself a time where you're not eating, um, then you're actually forcing the body to dip into its reserves to start using its backup fuel, its, its energy stores in the terms of, of fat. So you're forcing the body to sort of switch from burning carbs to burning fat, um, right. as well as other things that you're for, sort of forcing the body to, to have to do to make up the shortfall because obviously you're not you're not eating anything or not supplying everything on a constant drip feed all the time um so but, that metabolic effect is is the interesting thing for me so when we talk about this kind of fasting that you, you just mentioned are we talking about nothing nil by mouth or when we talk about fasting is it just i don't know beneath a certain number of calories i mean what what is the definition of the sort of fasting we're talking about? That's a really pertinent question because that's the thing that I'm really looking at at the moment because you could argue it's not necessarily down to the calories. It's not so much the energy. So you don't have to go all the way down to zero to get that effect. Um, you can allow a certain amount of food and obviously still be in that huge deficit in terms of fuel supply that forces the body to sort of switch into its reserves. Um, but one of the interesting things that we're looking at is that actually the thing that really makes a difference is the supply of the carbohydrate. So if you're constantly supplying carbohydrate all the time, that's the thing that triggers insulin release. That's the thing that starts your body using the carbs and storing it and utilizing it. Um, so actually it's probably like a threshold of carbohydrate um, that is causing you to switch. Now, whether that's a threshold overall that you need to sort of go below a certain sort of floor of say 100 grams of carbohydrate a day to kick this in, 
or whether it's just the fact that you might have a meal or several meals that don't have any carbohydrate in it that could have the same effect. So this is where you start to get the crossing over between things like intermittent fasting and low carb diets, keto diets, um, which, yeah. which are giving you a similar effect, but it's a way of doing that, but not all the time. Cause there's obviously downsides of cutting out the carbs altogether. Yeah, I used to do something, which I used to, if I had a, an awards thing to go to, uh, carb stripping, where yeah. I would do like a week of, 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 of eliminating carbs um, just just for that week. Um, it was a really quick way of losing weight, but not losing muscle and energy, um, because that's the thing that happens, isn't it? If you cut out, because when people say fasting, they automatically think of nil by mouth. And what happens to your brain when you are not eating anything at all? You go a bit, <laughs> a bit ditzy. Yeah. I mean, your body will respond by trying to keep the supply lines going as much as possible. So it will start manufacturing sugar, gl blood sugar, um, and it will start eventually turning to things like ketones to keep the supply to the brain going. Um, mm. But that doesn't necessarily happen straight away. So there's a bit of a transition into that. Um, but you're, what you're describing has been common practice throughout things like weight making sport. So jockeys and boxers and mixed martial artists, weight lift, and so um, people that are sort of bodybuilders have done that, cutting before an event. Yeah, so all of that sort of reducing water weight because you're stripping out or the glycogen in the body, which comes with, which alongside it comes lots of water. Um, and that's often what you see at the early stages of weight loss diets, where you get a, a big yeah. drop in weight in that first week. Often that's because you're, you're losing uh, yeah, body glycogen, your, your carbohydrate stores in, in your, in your muscle mainly, but also uh, in your liver too. So All yeah, right, that carbohydrate, which I think is the key thing. All right. Let, my question to you to finish with, for people listening, say, I want to do this. What would a sensible way of fasting, what would it look like? Take me through a, a, a day or a week of what you would actually do and when you would eat. And when you finished your fast at the end of the day does it matter what you eat can you just stuff your face or are you going to get a tummy ache are you going to feel ill do you gently introduce foods take me through a, a, a fasting regime if I, I can call it that okay. so i would say the most universally acceptable form is this time restricted eating so that would be where you look at your sort of normal eating window and you just reduce it down in terms of right. length so that might mean bringing your dinner earlier or and or your breakfast later to sort of squeeze that that eating window some people don't turn that into skipping a meal so they might skip breakfast or skip dinner but the idea is that you're really reducing the eating window and um, right. that's probably the safest more universally acceptable form because that's not necessarily going to give you weight loss it's not going to give you a big fasting period where that next meal, when you break that fast, is going to be uh, potentially problematic. Um, mm -hmm. So that will be the first introduction, an easy introduction to intermittent fasting to do that. If you're going to do something like the 5-2 or alternate day fasting, or even just one day or a couple of days a month for fasting, then you are looking at restricting your calories down, not necessarily down to zero mm. for that day, but maybe sort of reducing it down to around five or 600 calories a day. So that might be one meal, one small meal in a day or several small meals in a day. And no one's really looked at what the ideal pattern is during that sort of fasting period. Um, but the thing with that is just got to be a bit conscious of what meal you have when you break that fast the next day. So that yeah. break fast, breakfast, um, you wouldn't just go and just really hammer it and have a huge meal. 
because one thing that we've seen is you get sort of temporal glucose intolerance if you, after a fast potentially so if you start overeating and really going gorging on a meal afterwards you your tolerance to that might be slightly blunted um, all right and, and sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt we've got a call yeah. a question yeah. Sarah in ludlow uh sarah hello you wanted to ask um our doctor hello. a question yeah, what's your question for dr collins oh lovely thank you uh basically my husband um uh, he's very overweight and he's been on a calorie control diet through the the local surgery and um all of a sudden he had gallbladder problems uh and uh now i'm a great faster so i, I fast often but uh, my husband's developed uh, gallstones and he's got to have his gallbladder out. And right. in the information, uh, information from the um, hospital, it says that uh, dieting can give you gallstones. So I wondered what the truth is behind it, please. Oh, right. Yes. There you Yes, I mean, I think that's an interesting one. I'm sorry to hear about your husband um, suffering from that. That is uh, one of the things that is commonly reported, actually, with fasting, when people do long fasts, is that it can, like any sort of energy restriction, can lead to some gallstone development because you're not forcing the excretion of that that um, out, that gas juice out, that that. Um, oh, would that be the bile? Yes. So you're not. So you're. It's basically staying in your in your gallbladder for longer, and then potentially crystallising because you're not using it as much. You're not sort oh. of exiting it out as much. Um, so I don't know what form of um, of energy restriction he did, but that that's something that if you're susceptible to it, you need to be a bit careful and obviously be monitored when you're doing some form of calorie restriction and particularly something like fasting oh, right. um, i sometimes do a fast a day a week uh, so far so good but is that okay yes i think that's okay but maybe not a total fast maybe have some food in that fasting period maybe some some fat basically and have some sort of fat and protein that might trigger some release from your gallbladder that i mean i'm just thinking of that as a cause all right um can i mention um i i do have a thing for crunches so if i broke the fast with a crunchy would that help uh, sarah hello um hello Hello, sorry. Um, we've run, we've run out of time. Thank you for calling. Thank you for calling in, um, uh, Doctor. Obviously, we've got some questions there for you. Have to have you back on the show, uh, Doctor Adam Collins. Thank you so much for your time. He's a nutrition uh, consultant. We've learned a lot of, about fasting. We'll have to have you back on the show because all the questions are coming in. Thank you so much for your time today, though, uh, Doctor Adam Collins. As I said before, uh, lots of messages around Catherine, Kate, Re, the Princess of Wales. I think that she should be able to recover from her operation at home. Uh, Kate, such a fuss. You would think she was the centre for holding Playboy. That's Guy in Birmingham. Kate, Trisha, I wonder who will take the birthday photo of Louis next month. Good question. Hope it will be Kate. Kate, Nikki Johnson, he's so funny. Have him on again, please. A professional photographer took our wedding photos and the photo we chose to have up is the one with a tree growing out of my head. Oh, no. How many people has that happened to? Uh, in a moment... Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl. 
JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. A bit of breaking news. Uh, Russian exit polls show that Vladimir Putin wins the presidential election with 87.8% of the vote. Well, I tell you what, you don't need to be, have been a psychic to see that coming, which leads me very nicely into our next segment, as uh, yeah, I, I often have. It's a segment called I Believe. And today it's I believe, how does communicating with spirits actually work? Uh, who better to talk to us about that than George the Medium? He's a spiritual medium. Uh, his website says he's read for thousands of people over the years. He's been quoted as the real deal. He's got 22 years plus of experience working with the spirit world, known for a connection that provides you with factual details about your loved ones, leaving you with healing and comfort. George, the medium, joins me now. George, thank you so much for your time. So let's start with how does communicating with spirits, how does it actually work? What do you do? So the, the misconception is that we um, receive things w from the spirit world in a psychic way. So really, psychic information is reading you. So health, wealth, love, life, marriage and career is all to do with you and that psychic work. When we work with the spirit world, though, the, the mediumship side of things is that spiritual communication where what happens is they drop their thoughts and memories into the medium's mind, which then becomes a, a kind of a vision in what we call the clairvoyance. So the old old school term of the clairvoyant vision, where the clairvoyant medium would see the information like a TV screen. Basically, that's the easiest way to think of it. At that same moment, though, it's backed up with emotions and feelings. So I always say to people, if you think of a happy memory from your childhood, 
And the way that you think of that memory is kind of the same way that spirit communicate. The thought comes into your mind of the memory, it becomes a picture or a video, and it then has an emotional reaction. The difference is we have consecutive information that comes through from the spirit world. So people in, who have passed on want to share their memories and their stories and their joy. And, and really it's a lot more happier than what people seem to think because they don't want to always talk about when they passed away. They may want to touch on that, but it's such a big life to speak of. So that's kind of the, the, the kind of the technicalities and the simplest form for people to understand. So here's the question, why you? I mean, when did you develop, did you develop this ability? Did you suddenly realize you, you had this ability? Why? How? <laughs> yeah, so I'm kind of different because most people kind of remember and have gift as a child and things like that. And for me, my great grandmother passed away when I was 18 and I lived on my own and four weeks to the day, I had this feeling of someone standing from my bed and there she was. And I'm quite scientific because I'm kind of like, let's look at the natural thing before we look at the supernatural. So I got out of bed at three, four in the morning and walked towards her and she disappeared. I'd never seen spirit so clear as that ever in my life from that moment. So then I started to have all these weird experiences and I really thought I was kind of um, having major issues. Went to the doctor, mm -hmm. was referred to psychiatric hospital because I was hearing voices in my mind. Yeah. And so, that was my way of understanding it. And I kind of know that a lot of people have that same struggle. So eventually I, I built up the courage to tell my mum and I was like, hey, mum, I think I'm psychic. And it was the only way I knew to, to explain yeah. it. And she goes, oh, I know. And I was like, what do you mean you know? And she said, oh, as a child, we, I have a huge family. And so she was, says there was always, my birthday, for example, all the kids are running about and I'm in the corner talking to the person that nobody can see. But for me, I could, and I was frustrated with, the, with people not knowing that. that. So my mum said you would want two, two drinks of juice, two packets of crisps, two sandwiches for me and the person. Friend. And so, yeah, pretty much. And it was always different kind of people. And one of the most weird ones was my mum and I met a friend of hers in town. I go away to just play. I think I was about six years of age. My mum has a conversation with her friend. I come back because we're leaving. And I said to my mum, mum, that's a shame that lady's dad is in heaven because he had a sore heart. And my mum's friend had just told her, Irene, my dad passed away with a heart attack. So kind of weird things like that. But I remember none of it, absolutely none of it. And by the age of nine, it left to my mum's kind of relief because there was always just weird, spooky things going on. Um, so it, it was more comforting to finally hear that, but I don't remember it, whereas so many people do. And we kind of say it runs in the family sometimes. My grandfather on my father's side was very spooky, but in his generation, it was not talked about. So... No. I was going to ask you, do you think we all have psychic ability? It's just that some people, it comes through more, maybe the rest of us... Uh, other people suppress it because, yeah, as you say, it's it's not done to talk about it or even recognise it. Yeah, so I I kind of describe it as the way of um, a, a reference of like sound. So I believe we're all psychically uh, aware and and we all have psychic abilities. Not everybody's a medium, so every medium is psychic, but not every psychic is a medium. So the way to understand it easy is everybody on the earth can make sound. Whether people can right. speak or not, we're able to make sound. So, but we all, all don't sound like Whitney, Mariah and Celine. So I kind of it, like compare it to that, that some people are more naturally talented at it, but we have to work and we have to discipline and, and develop. Like I, I stopped drinking and I stopped going like partying because I wanted to dedicate my life to this. So yes, I believe we all have psychic senses where you walk into a room and you can feel something or you got a lot of these signs from the spirit world. And the wonderful thing is when we pass over, our loved ones come to, to get us, which is a wonderful thing because then we have these people who are, are maybe worried or, and then all the spirit world are around. And that's probably some of the nicest things that I've ever been able to share is that people feel they, maybe they didn't get to be with their loved one. Maybe they were rushing to get there and the person passed away. And it's nice to then say, oh, you know, these people were coming through to, to, to welcome them over. So it's, and I always look at the joy in it. I, I don't feel we should live in the misery or the sadness and we should touch on maybe some serious parts, but people want yeah. to hear their joy. Like they, they had wonderful lives and they want to share that. Um, and they describe themselves in the way they want to be seen. That's probably what I feel is more important because people think of people 
when they pass away, maybe they're elderly and, and they're losing their hair or they're lost their sight. And they come through looking 23, you know, with beautiful ah, hair. And... Ah. So, so to finish up, George, do people yeah. have, do you have to see the person face to face to contact their loved ones? Is it about their physical presence that, that allows the spirit to come? Or can you literally be on the phone or video conference or something like that? Yeah, so being in, in the person's um, presence, for, for me specifically, I don't look at my clients when I'm reading for them because I face the wall because I don't want them to think I'm reading their body language, which a lot of fakes do. They, they'll ask suggestive questions. With mediumship, yeah. we, should, we should not be asking questions. We should be providing the evidence and they should only respond with yes, no, I don't know, so that we're not then being fed the information. But for me, privately, I face the wall just so I'm not looking at them. Video uh, is good for reaching people around the world. I just sometimes feel for the person more than anything, there's, there's something missing. So they don't get the same kind of feeling as being in the room. I, I don't get me wrong. I, I, I've done online readings, but I always feel from the client's point of view, they they kind of, they feel like there's maybe, you can't feel that energy in the room as yeah. much as when you're here over a, a video camera, but it does work. So if people want to get in contact with you, as I looked at your website, just Google George, the medium, um, yep. George has been, George, thank you so much for your time. It's been really lovely meeting you. George, the medium there, talking about uh, the spirit world, how he's a spiritual medium. Um, somebody who's actually with us is Sunday night with Mark Saggers. Mark, Trish. yesterday, all right, we were talking about footballers cutting holes in their socks yeah. uh, and why they did it. Um, and I said, I've got to, when I do the hand, I've got to ask Mr. Saggers what he thinks about it. Yeah, well, they're ripping them as well. They've been doing it since the last World Cup, a lot of them. And uh, it, w w what they say they do it for is to release some of the tension in the calf muscle. That right. makes them feel a lot better. There are various different bits and pieces. Socks these days are, are very different to how, how a lot of us remember them. I can tell you that when with the football.